Hey guys, it's Anne. Welcome to the channel. This channel is all about home worm composting. So if you're looking for a very active community of worm farmers that are willing to help everybody out, you're in the right place. Okay, today, as you can tell, blue is very full again. And uh, that is because I have put some of my leftover bins in here to complete drying so that I can sift them and get some castings because tis the season I need to make some seed starting mix which I will show at the end and also uh, Blue needs to get his space back. I had worked so hard to do that and now I filled him up again. So let me show you what I'm using. If you look in the description below you will find these particular sieves. They fit in a five gallon bucket even though I don't use it for that very often. This is the one quarter inch and I use it the most. So if you only have to buy one and not the whole set, because they are a little pricey, um, I would buy the one quarter inch or the one eighth inch. Now, basically, I've been using this for everything from bonsai soil to worm castings for seven years now, and they are still in very good shape. So although they are a bit pricey, they're well worth it. And if you use the Amazon link below, uh, the channel will get a little bit of a commission, although you will not pay a dime more. All right. So because it's kind of dry, I am able to sift quite a bit. And because this was the leftover bin, basically this is all of the chunks that are probably gonna take on the order of years to break down. There's no, you know, no rushing it. Might as well just let it do its thing. But I do uh, sift it out occasionally, put water in it with a little bit of worm chow so the worms get interested in doing this again. But I put that in a different bin and I don't generally show it to you guys. Which I can. I can show you at the end here what my leftover bin looks like. Because some of these things have been going at it for, you know, years different seeds and nuts and things like that. It just takes a very long time to break down and I don't use my outdoor compost very much anymore. Mostly I put everything in the worm bins with the exception of uh, yard waste. Generally with normal castings, I generally get about 50%. I'm not getting that much right now because these are in particular, very hard things, but I'm breaking up the clumps as I can. And then these overs are going into a special bin. When you're using these sieves, it really is worth your time to do small handfuls because otherwise, if the castings are even the teeniest bit wet, they will clump up. And then you'll just end up with hard little little pea-sized balls of castings, and those will harden into an almost rock-like um, condition. So that's also another reason why you want to only sift reasonably dry castings. If they are even a tiny bit wet, you're absolutely not going to get very far. So this is one of those things that I'm talking about where if you sift when it's too wet, which I apparently did once upon a time, these will become very hard and I can barely break them apart. So when I get this back into the leftovers bin, I'm going to put a significant amount of water in there and make sure everything gets softened back up again so the worms can get at it. After I get some sifting done, then we're going to evaluate blue and see what kind of food he needs. It's been about three or four weeks since we've been in here, so he's probably very, very ready for a feeding. But just kind of, you know, there's a few worms here and there, but for the most part, when you dry it out, all the worms leave. So then you can feel pretty confident going in there and kind of squishing any of those hard clumps so that you can get the castings. This is about a five-year-old 
pumpkin stem. Finally getting somewhere with it to where it's actually crumbling. But not 100% yet. Here where I am in zone five in Illinois, I'm uh, ramping up to get planting here in about three weeks. I planted some things that are cold hardy, uh, things that stay below the soil for a while before they pop up like potatoes. So I've already used a lot of my worm castings to get my potatoes started. I put in some new raised bins th beds this year and used a lot of the castings to enrich the normal garden soil that I put in there. Normally I use these up over the, the length of the season, but because I put in the raised beds, I've been using these at a much faster pace. still have about one more of these leftover bins that I need to process and then I will have gone down from six of them down to two so it takes I usually let them sit for I don't know maybe six months before I try and, and get anything out of them again and they are 100% hands-off the worm cocoons that are in here will hatch and then they will grow up and deal with this. I'm being gentle as I push things and squish them so I don't get, you know, hurt anything that's in there. Okay, that's a pretty good amount. There will still be, people ask this all the time, you know, how are you gonna rescue the cocoons from in here? Because this bed is a mix of the red wigglers, the blue worms, and the European night crawlers. And uh, I just honestly, the cocoons are just gonna have to go be free in the garden. Because in order to sift blue cocoons, you would need like a 1 20th of an inch or a half a millimeter. And uh, honestly, ain't nobody got time for that. So this is going to go into my pan where I'm starting my seed starting mix, and I'll show you that at the end. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of move that just a little bit, loosen this up. I'm not going to do a full fluff on this. I'm just going to break up the big clumps at this moment so that they can dry out so I can harvest them. Anything big that I can remove and add to the, the feeding end or back into the leftovers bin. Might as well do that now. But yeah, everything's, this is a, uh, it's damp, so the worms can still move through it. But it is definitely too, too damp to sift with a one quarter inch. So I'm just going to move that over. Break up all the clumps while it's damp. When it gets hard, then you can't break up the clumps very easily. And it's also not usable by the worms, so it's one of those things you definitely need to do. All right, there we go. He's set up again for the next harvest. Okay, let's do the reveal. Okay, so this center line here is generally where the business starts. This part right here is probably about five months old and the worms have not been fed directly in this area for about five months. They're in this area so they can finish up any little nice nuggets of food and then also so the worms can depopulate and move down that end and get uh, towards the real good food. And it happens slowly. I mean, you'll see the the concentration of worms here is definitely noticeable, but not anywhere near what a normal worm bin is. So 
So I'm just going to lightly fluff that up a little bit, move it over, and then slowly start moving towards the business end of the bin. And if you look at the roly polies here, they're eating this avocado pit. I don't know if you can see that very well, but they're inside there and I can already feel that it's getting squishy. So that's good. We'll move that down to the other end. Okay. Let me move you down to the business end. Here we are at the business side of the bin. Everything's looking nice and fluffy here. Good amount of worms, but not too much. I'm gonna just kind of, oops. Oh, looks like they're inside of an avocado. No, or was that a mango? Avocado. They're all kind of hanging out inside that little pit. We'll move them down there. And we'll just keep moving anything that's not finished. Okay. But these castings are looking great. Just the increase in temperature in the basement over the last month has really got them going fast. Good worms. So yeah, I think I think I am starting to think this is either the um, the fiber from the Amazon tape or something. So I'm going to start taking these strings out when I find them. Yeah, when they say things are compostable, you know, I think their level of discretion of what that means is a little too broad for worm farming. A lot of things that say they're compostable are not vermicompostable, or at least not 100%. Okay, so that is looking good. Everything is a great moisture down here. Now that the uh, furnace is not on all the time, the moisture down here stays pretty even, which is great for me. I don't have to worry about the worms too much because when it dries out, I think, uh, what is it, V says, if, wor if the worms dry out, they die or something. She's got a t-shirt. Uh, that is 100% true. Worms can live through a lot of conditions, but if it gets super dry, if they don't have some place to go, they will die. All right. So I'm just moving the bottom stuff to the top, making sure to get air all the way through, especially in this part where there's likely to be some sort of food in here, even though it's probably well, well done. Inside of a mango pit there. Okay, so that looks good. Now we're slowly creeping to the part where they have been fed the most recent. So we should start seeing an increase in the concentration of worms there. And we might possibly see, you know, some food that has not been 100% degraded. That's how the wedge system works, is that you just feed at the one end, and then the worms slowly keep moving towards that. So as this castings here dry out, the worms will leave it and move for an area that is much better. So seeing lots of worms, haven't seen any food yet. Ooh, getting a big concentration of worms here. There we go. So that's what I mean when they're migrating from the dried finished part of the castings to over here. You see what the concentration of worms is here and you saw it when I was down there and it is probably tenfold more worms. Now, you know, some of them do stay here and finish up whatever's going on, but the vast majority will continue all the way to the other end where all of the fresh food is. Like this part right here, that is just pure castings. They have been working really hard. It gets to be that time of the year where it's nice and warm and wow, are they going at it. I think this is a ginger. This is ginger sprout, just off of a peeling. I'm gonna keep that. I'm gonna try and grow ginger this year. 
I was actively trying to grow ginger. I've got a pot where I'm starting to grow it. I go through quite a bit of ginger, so if I can grow it myself, I'm gonna call that a win. Ugh, stupid strings. Okay, so I'm not having any inkling of any sort of sour smell. So that is one of the benefits of getting in here about once a month and turning over the, the entire system. But you can see underneath that cover, they are just making castings. That is a straight up castings there. Okay. Getting towards the end here. Lots of worms. And it smells wonderful. It smells like a forest after a rain. Wow. It, it always surprises me every year when the weather gets warmer, how fast these guys start eating. It's amazing. And I think that the, the combination of red wigglers, blue worms, and European night crawlers really is good because when it's cooler, the European night crawlers and the uh, red wigglers are at their best. And then when it warms up, then the blue worms are at their best. So when uh, the basin, basement doesn't typically get real hot, I would say that 80 Fahrenheit is probably the top. But you get up to like 80 degrees Fahrenheit and the European night crawlers and the red wigglers are starting to slow down a little bit. They don't go full on dormant, but they do slow down. And uh, the, the blue worms will just crank it up a notch and fill in the gaps. All right, if we're going to get a worm ball, it's going to be here. Well, kind of a diffused worm ball. The bin also kind of slopes this way, so any extra moisture will come down to this end of the bin. And you can still see it's nice and fluffy, but it does have a really good moisture. Okay, still no worm ball. We're fine. Maybe. Let's see. Big concentration of worms there. So it looks like we're seeing some skins or something here. I'm not sure. Pumpkin stem from this year. Oil. I also think having an active population of other kinds of critters in my bin is, is also why it cycles so efficiently. Lots of isopods and everything. It's one of the reasons that I, I try not to use any kind of uh, neem cake. If you've watched some of my old videos, I did try and get rid of mites, etc. with neem cake and stuff like that. But lately, I'm just of a mind that it is a system. And the system needs everybody, even if they aggravate me. I'm not a huge fan, personally, of the springtails. Uh, they really just creep me out. But I also realize that they are necessary to keep my worm bin functioning quickly. So, um, lately, I've just been sucking it up. And letting the worm bin ecosystem do what it's supposed to do. Oh, I think that was a worm ball and I just messed it up. Man. All right. Yep, that's them in uh, avocado. So earlier we saw where the isopods were in the avocado pit and now they've chewed it down to where the worms can get at it. But yeah, so everything is looking great. I think this is a pineapple butt. Yeah, but with food prices getting where they're at right now, I mean, it's double, double of what it was last year, at least where I live. I'm going to try and grow more food to kind of offset any sort of price increases that we're seeing this year. in the comments below, anybody who's still here after the length of time I've been yammering on, 
you know, what are you doing to try and offset the inflation right now? I think it's hitting the entire planet. So I know that I have individuals from most of Europe, Australia, and I think everybody is starting to, to feel that hit. I'm not, you know, an you know, economist or, or whatever you want to call it. I don't have a degree in anything like that. So I'm not 100% sure why everything is double in price. But something about COVID and politics, I have a feeling. That's pretty much the go-to these days. But that doesn't matter to me on my end, the why of it. I just have to try and mitigate it. Which, of course, all of these lovely castings are saving me from spending money on compost and fertilizer. Um, somewhat. I mean, still need some fertilizer for the heavy feeders, but trying to do things myself. All right, so we finally got to the part where we can feed Blue. So let me grab him some bedding and some food. Okay, so we've got some of the regular bedding and then we also have some leaves from me cutting back my houseplants. But since I have... Uh, worms and isopods living in my bedding container that I go fish from. That stuff is already starting to break down. You can see the the fiddle, the fiddle leaf fig leaf has got quite a few holes in it and that's uh, courtesy of the little isopods I believe. Okay, we've got garlic that didn't make the cut, moldy bread, some tostadas, Some kitchen scraps here. Got these reusable Ziploc bags that I use for the worm food. I'm gonna try and put those in the the links below so you guys can find them. I'm gonna try and find a gallon one because the half gallon is not useful for big big stuff. And we make it work because I already bought them, but I really do wish they were bigger. Since there was no evidence of food, we're going to give Blue a pretty good size feeding today. I'm going to put this super wet on top of that dry bread. Okay, well, let's get a little bit more bedding. Okay, we're going to do something weird. Found some of these in the back of my cabinet and they are stale. I think they're about three years old basically oversized pork rinds that you make into taco meat. Okay, and another tray of bedding and stuff. That doesn't look like it's enough to cover. Let me get another one. There we go. So that's probably about three or four gallons of bedding and about a gallon of food for Blue here. I'm gonna do a little bit of watering because that bedding was not as wet as I would want it to be. Um, hang on and I will show you how I make my seed starting mix. But yeah, that bedding was not super wet, so I don't want... These things are cool. They don't screw or anything. They just kind of fit on there and they don't fall off, so that's cool. So Blue has been taken care of for another three weeks or so. Let me go get the leftover bin and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So this is the leftover bin. This is what I've been putting all of my overs on. You can see there's worms in here, but it's mostly a bunch of stuff that it's just gonna take years to break down. I don't make videos about it, but this is in the background someplace with a lid on it, just working away. I keep it nice and wet, way wetter than I would ever keep a worm bin. This is probably like mud. So that's what I do with the overs uh, for the worm bins that are not blue. Blue usually eats his own leftovers, but for the other worm bins, all of their overs go into these kind of bins, which I just uh, add a little bit of worm chow to every once in a while, get the microbes going, and then the worms can work on this. Uh, after six months, I think I have reduced it by two-thirds. So, just a little side project that uh, I don't really usually bring you guys into very often. But I know some people had asked me, because I've mentioned it, to have me show it. And 
here it is. The worm population grows because there's lots of cocoons in here, and then they take care of things. And then when I dump it on blue, all the worms get into blue, and then just the cocoons are left when I do the sifting. And then it starts all over again. All right, let's go look at my seed starting mix. Okay, so here we are. And this is the castings that we just harvested just a second ago. Probably about a gallon of those. This is about three gallons of perlite, large size perlite. And then three gallons of coconut coir. And I mix these up evenly. And I make sure that I keep it wet so that I don't breathe in any of the, especially the perlite. Don't breathe in any of that dust. And then I store it in kind of a wet, partially wet state. That way the worm castings stay alive until I get to do all of my planting. This is basically the same mix I use for all of my potted plants, seeding or seed starting, bonsais. Bonsais are usually a little heavier on the perlite or diatomaceous earth. But yeah, I just mix this up, keep wetting it as I go until it's about as wet as a wrung out sponge. And then that's how it stays. So I know a lot of people had asked about that, so I thought I would show that here at the end for the people that are sticking around. Now, if you like the video of Blue, he has a playlist that's right over here. And if you've already seen that, YouTube thinks you're gonna like this video over here. All right, guys, thanks for hanging out with me and my worms, and everybody, have a good day.